it seems there are some issues with uh, the audio, although it's a visual system. So, so there is always a question as to why some of the sessions are kept last. So, koi ki duk be digan be no tu etle bada betha chhe. Koi ki duk sati sar tamaru chetle bada mode sudhi beshe etle chilu rakhi. I think Ahmedabad team is very smart with Chetan Bhai and Manish Bhai at the helm of affairs. Emne thayu ka abdi HLA itni vato kari ne lepto ne Brussels ana abdu non-infectious. But aoti kala su karvano chhe. Tomorrow morning, what are we going to see? Akho divas respiratory infections. So to you know, keep us grounded, that we have to be very heavy, we have to be very heavy. We have to be very heavy. So where is my presence? Sir, uh, one more question. I have to say that I have to say that I have to say that I have to say non-Gujarati people may not understand that the line <laughs> the line between rationality and irrationality is also very thin. Yes. So, you are the best person to... Uh, to, to Thank uh, you. Uh, what right. is Lakshma Rekha? What is Lakshma Rekha? So, uh, these respiratory infections are, you all know, is very, very common. They are our, I wouldn't say bread and butter, but that they occupy a large chunk of our practice every day in, day and out. So, this is more of a kind of a brushing up our knowledge about how we should treat our... Uh, mainly upper respiratory infection that we see in office practice. So I have taken few uh, uh, no common uh, upper respiratory infections for discussions and for that we have a very elite panelist here. Uh, my personal introduction, Amrut, uh, uh, Narmada, Bulti Amruta Boli Gopan Netle, she is Amrut. Kanke, no, so everywhere you see her in IAP activities, no? I had the opportunity to work with her in 2019 EB and I have seen her you know, vibrant way in which she handles everything. Hiral Ben, I have worked with her on adolescent medicine several times. I have come to Ahmedabad. She has come to Baroda. So, uh, uh, a beautiful association in terms of you now working with adolescent health. Jai Dirwani, Gambir looking at the match. And no Ganiwar Mari Sate, I am a panel discussion. I am partly the very sincere person. Samir Bhai, you know, Atra Tatra Sarvatra Samir, Atyar Amar Yehu Kya Vaish Hai. He is so energetic, he is so full of energy that he takes up responsibility everywhere and he lives up to that. So, what happened? Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. So, first of all, why are we discussing? As I made a background that uh, respiratory infections are our day-to-day -day practice. So, and most important thing is that all the while when we attend any CMEs or ID uh, no programs, we always talk about AMR, antimicrobial resistance and how we can prevent that because AMR is going to take a big, big, big uh, no, uh, uh, leap forward in terms of making us very incapable of treating common infection. So every time we treat, I mean, talk about any infection, we must focus on how we can prevent antimicrobial resistance. So... We'll discuss viral infections, pharyngotonsillitis, acute otitis media, acute, uh, acute bacterial sinusitis, CRU, uh, pertussis and uh, no, community acquired pneumonia. So this will again be a more of a rapid fire because we are only 40 minutes and uh, we have a lot of questions about these common conditions. So Narmada, what does uh, rational antimicrobial practice mean to you and what are the various reasons for irrational use of antimicrobial? Just enumerate, no details. Rational antibiotic practice is nothing but giving the right antibiotic for the right condition in the right dosage for the appropriate time. Right. And be okay, brave enough to step it down when it is not required. What the main reason of antibiotic using the irrational use is three things. One is pressure on ourselves. We feel very jittery when we see we write only paracetamol. We ourselves have a doubt hmm. uh, whether we are on the right track. The second thing, pressure from the parents and pressure from sometimes pressure from the industries too. Right, these are the right. things. Audience, Madhya, add karus? Because I love audience participation. In a panel discussion, I think audience are the experts actually. So, Tamara, Madhya, koi add karu hoy to? Yes. 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 I think this is the most common. I mean, I've been working in this, uh, you know, field of promoting rational therapy and this is the most common cause for no 
because you are not able to you know have confidence in yourself if i don't try an antibiotic nothing is going you know to go wrong with my patient so lack of faith in science and sometimes we say ke bhai guideline to aave ne jaye thik che badlaya kare che no that's a common excuse that we give ke guidelines to badlaya eno su meaning che ke je kale na padi thi aaj ha padi avti kale na padse then lack of confidence as digan say lack of communication skill no we know that i don't have to prescribe but i don't have that confidence of communicating the same science to the patient in the language that he can understand fear of patient changing the doctor ke hu nahi lakhu to bije jata rahe and a commercial interest yes he mentioned about it and sometimes there is sheer ignorance they don't know what they are doing jem jesus christ ne latkai de amne kidu they don't know what they are doing ena jevo hoy cha yes you don't write by provisional diagnosis because you are afraid that somebody will read my precision and then me lakhu che viral urt enu lakhu chu antibiotic so that is why people don't write uh, no diagnosis from panel discussion that is also very important and sometimes no humor humor takes over the real messages i i totally agree with you so what are the commonly seen viral infections uh, hiral ben what are the commonly seen ऑडियंस होशियार थी गुजा बहुत सो वॉट आर द कॉमनली सीन वायरल इन्फेक्शन ऑफ आर टी आई वॉट एंड हाउ ऑफन यू यूज लेबोरेटरी फॉर मेकिंग अ डेफिनेटली डायग्नोज ऑफ वायरल एक्सपेन्टरी इन्फेक्शन एंड हाउ ऑफन एंड विच एंटीवायरल तो पहला वायरल न पता ही दिए पे एंटीबायोटिक Thank you, Satish Bhai. Uh, very happy to be in on the panel with you. So, uh, commonly, uh, what we see in pediatric age group is RSV, influenza group of viruses, uh, all the H1N1, H3, N2, A, B, and para influenza. We also uh, saw COVID, uh, so coronavirus, and uh, other. Recently, we are seeing adenovirus more so, and uh, other viruses like rhinovirus are a little less common. Right, and how often you come across? oh very common it so do you use laboratory to make a diagnosis of viral infection no sir so for routine viral uh, common cough and cold with uh, a stable child and where uh, we are very sure that this is viral we don't need any laboratory investigations but uh, for say example uh, it's a Uh, infant less than three months, or an immunocompromised child, or if I'm in uh, suspecting influenza and I want to be sure, uh, then I may ask for an influenza uh, test. But if there is an epidemic of flu going on, then I will not test. And I, so category B and C, I may just start I like like illness and start oseltamivir. Right. So the message here is that as we talk about you uh, know rational therapeutics, there has to be rational diagnostics also. So what she said is very true that you don't jump to you know doing PCR or multiplex PCR in all the patients. You select your patient and use it because throughout the uh, you know yesterday and today we have been discussing about you no know, molecular diagnosis all that. But you don't have to use it in your office practice. And uh, this she has already answered that we use oseltamivir in epidemic uh, situation. Yes, yes, Digan. One mic, then I'll be rapping. No, no, it's a samra. It's a matter. Bijo ka meaning na the. <laughs> yeah, please please give him mic so that others can yes please <laughs> please nahi nahi please please aapke paas time ocho che okay if you are enjoying we are we don't mind nahi nahi you you really wanted to make some comment seriously yes so let it was not to show my presence but uh, When so on my part treat, also i mean i didn't mean anything when you are treating a case and you are sure about means you are sure in the sense by your clinical judgment you are sure that you are treating a viral infection but the case is taking unusual progress yeah. in that case definitely you go for uh, say agreed a agreed CRT agreed testing or a, a other testing a case of influenza which you know that should get cured by 5 or 6 days but over 5 or 6 days the child has deteriorated or there is a some complication in that case definitely it warrants so the pcrs are not uh, totally 
useless things. They are useful. Yes, yes. So that is what she said that in given circumstances, we are just talking about OPD. Any other panelists want to make comment on this? You are all with on the same page, right? So you, it's very common to get three to eight colds per year in less than five years. Influenza-like illnesses is something different from common cold when there is more of systemic, you know, symptoms like fever, etc. And you don't uh, need to give a lot of things on except for symptomatic treatment. But at the same time, we have to give the warning signs to the patient as to when they have to come back. And we have to use the artificial other multiplies judiciously. Oseltamir, you we already discussed. So here we are not discussing the cup cold, uh, you know, OTC medicines of late because the government has banned the use uh, below four years, which I welcome uh, with utmost uh, pleasure. I remember in Ahmedabad only some time back, some few years back, I had a presentation on critic on uh, no cup cold medicines. And this was our reason that it should be banned below four years. So it's a good thing which has happened. Uh, we can discuss it sometime later. Now talking about pharyngitis or follicular tonsillitis, how do you differentiate between viral and bacterial? Is it always possible? Is it practical? And what are the fears on withholding antibiotics? What are the perceived risks? Can I uh, change the sequence of answering? Wh whichever way you want. Uh, because the uh, last two answer already we had discussed, so we can just take on the few things which is not taken. Uh, what are the perceived risks and the uh, what are the fears on withholding the antibiotic? Hmm. So perceived risk already uh, losing the patient, what we had already discussed in your first slide. Specific. Uh, specific. These are generic reasons. Uh, yeah. Uh, specifically, here again, the uh, worsening of the condition, that is one of the fear in these cases. Then diagnostic dilemma always make that thing, whether it will be viral or the bacterial, that will be uh, uh, withholding. Thinking the requirement is the prevention of the secondary bacterial infection in viral. That may be the one of the reasons. Then patients demand that may be uh, not uh, fulfilled if we not write the antibiotic. That type of the things is also there. And thought that the antibiotic will be required as an add-on medicine in overall. These are the fears so, what we are Sameer usually thinking. Is what you are enumerating is basically the fears that we have. But yeah. are they justified? Yeah, that are just, myths. Absolutely, or, it is yeah. a justifiable that we can. Uh, but it is not that thing. It is not uh, pursued things. Uh, we have it is definitely we can implement in our uh, practice. Uh, but it will be the, depends on the our own mindset. Because we have to differentiate, that is the first answer of that thing, viral and bacterial, how we mm. can differentiate. Mm. Depends on the, our clinical ground, uh, like the, we having a, some uh, influenza-like illnesses and the constitutional symptoms are there, that is more favoring of the viral illnesses. Mm. Same thing in the history in the family, that is give the indication of the viral infection. Right. Age of, uh, of the uh, patient, that is also indicated the early age, more of the viral, and then followed by the in school going in. Bacterial may be the more common. Something as per the epidemiological presentation, that is also which season it is going and how epidemics is going on in overall up, uh, in area. That are the more common. And last and not least, the, uh, how it is progressing and the, how it's onset. That is the acute onset with the acute progress that will be more favoring the bacterial. So that is a differentiation. We can take a uh, look. And we can definitely differentiate the, this type of the viral and bacterial. Uh, Anything other panelists want to add to this? Sir, you've asked, is it always possible to differentiate viral bacterial? Most, a lot of times it is possible, but there are a lot of times when we are confused whether it is viral or bacterial. Okay. So the better way to go about is wait for 48 hours. you want to add something which will add to our differentiation between viral and bacterial? Apart from what he said, no, family history, epidemic. Yeah, so multi-system involvement. Uh, so viral would have other system like we'll have a GI symptom or coryza so rash. Systemic, it's a, it's a widespread it, infection. Yes. Whereas bacterial is a tends to localize. That is the it, basic difference even between on viral. On examination, and viral would have a. So when we are talking about pharyngitis, uh, what will be the difference between a viral infection and? Uh, It'll be more of a generalized congested throat. While a bacterial would have exudates, you may see yes. petechiae on the palate. You will there will be a painful throat. Viral painful is, throat can yeah, occur in both. Yes, but you will have lymph, lymph nodes, nodes. Lymph uh, nodes. cervical yes. lymph nodes. That anything so, else you want to add, Narmada? Uh, what I see is more in the older age group, that is above five years, if they come associated, yes. there is more of a bacterial, I would say. Right. And if it's a lesser, uh, younger age group associated you with more, more of a systemic symptom, it's a viral, I would say. Right, right. So he, he mentioned about it, family history. So once you have a uh, patient with you know, exudates, what can be the differential diagnosis? Do you need to investigate? And when do you investigate? 
and any role of culture dr jay so majority of the cases of exudative tonsillitis or pharyngitis are because of the group a beta hemolytic streptococcus right uh, followed by sometimes eb virus and uh, diphtheria Okay. Early stages of diphtheria, we may not have the pseudomembranous tonsillitis, Very true. but simple follicular tonsillitis, which may progress to become a uh, pseudomembranous tonsillitis. So generally, you don't investigate, right? Unless the course is unfamiliar, you will go for investigation. The theory says that uh, even if the we are suspecting the group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, you may go for the rapid antigen detection test, but cl uh, clinically, we usually don't How go for the... How many of you the... do a rapid antigen here in this crowd? Have you heard about it? All of you? Yeah. None of us are doing, not available, but it is being done somewhere. Narmada, you can throw yeah, some light. Because in, Narmada knows about it. There is uh, Chaitest Hospital, there was a study done by SBSO which said that use of uh, rapid antibiotic, uh, it rationalized the treatment as well as cut down on the duration of the course of illness when it is going to be group A. So that is what we are also having certain labs that are doing it in uh, thing. So now uh, when I see a child who is sick looking and uh, definitely having, we go ahead with doing a rapid antigen test. The cost is comparatively less, but the only problem is how to get the correct sample, and the cooperation right. of the child. So because the sample is not right, then it might be just a commensal and you might be hitting this thing. So beyond three days, child is very sick looking. If I'm able to get the sample, then rapid antigen test I definitely use. Right. So in our day-to-day -day practice, I mean, this session is meant for giving you no know, day-to-day practice message. We don't need culture, we don't need uh, rapid antigen as in our practice. You can make a clinical diagnosis and confidently treat the patient accordingly. So now, once you have made a diagnosis of you know, bacterial tonsillitis, how do you choose an antibiotic for this condition? Is there any issue of dose? What are and what are not the alternatives and why, Narmada? Yeah. So the, as we already you discussed, if it's a bacterial Sorry. group. You wanted to make some comments? Yes. It will be positive. Yes. So that yes. is why we said, I'm not doing it routinely. When the so, child is sick looking and the clinical indication is there, you want to decide there is a rash accompanying, then we do it as a thing. That's what I said, it could still be a commensal. Do the clinical indication as a So ultimately it comes so to we're that we're not doing only. it as a routine practice. I'm not recommending as a routine practice. At so, all. Yes. There are certain criteria for it. So somehow the standard treatment guidelines released last year for are very, uh, very adamant on going for the aridity. And if you are... So more, I think it, uh, the literature comes from Western countries where they it's a protocol actually okay. to do it. So, we so, have our different uh, no, resources. We have our different conditions. So we don't have it to... It has got it. value. That's what I said in Dr. Western Amrita, you country. Want to say something? Yeah, that is what she said. Yes. So that's what the thing. Okay. See the so thing is that West always... Is it they... necessary? I mean, that's the question here. Yes. So for yeah, so for study purpose, for uh, teaching institutes, I think, and protocol driven uh, no systems, that's fine. But otherwise, for this crowd, including myself, no, we don't do and we sir, don't. If it is uh, sorry, sir, if it is available, I would want to do it. I mean, so uh, follow uh, Amruta's uh, instruction. Go deep. <laughs> irritate the child. Uh, irritate sir, the so parents. Sir. And then they will go Sir, back. Uh, this is an older age group of child and the let, child let may know. cooperate. This let, is an older age know. group, right? Streptococcal, we are suspecting 5 to 15. So, older age group. So, uh, it may be possible to do a good collection. Okay. So, Hiral will do it, but I will not do it anyway. So, yes. Center score. Yeah, that I have really not score. taken up that because in our day-to-day -day practice, we don't take any scorecard. I don't at least take and we see the patient and we take a call. But before prescribing you no know, antibiotic, you should actually think about it. That I am am I seeing signs of bacterial infection or can I wait or not? While waiting, you no, know, we didn't talk about rheumatic fever. That was that is not seen nowadays, but it's a it's a theoretical threat that if you do not treat your child may end up with rheumatic fever, but there the window is very very uh, good actually. Nine days. You can delay the treatment up to nine days. Nothing will happen. Sorry? No, it's not. Yes, I have heard about it, I have read about it, but we don't do it. Okay. Very, very clear. So, it is very clear in the guidelines, also in standard treatment guidelines, though they have given RADT, they have clearly differentiated the children into well child and the sick child. 
right. only in a case of a sick child when the clinical suspicion is there and you are suspecting more of a bacterial pharyngitis. They have so, we move on. We have diagnosed uh, follicular tonsillitis or pharyngitis. So, Narmada now. The antibiotic of choice, everybody knows it's amoxicillin only. The hmm. choice comes for us is whether to go for the routine normal dosage of 40 to 50 milligram or with a recent uh, trend in the commercial thing to go up for the higher dosage. The recommendations are very clear that we still have sensitivity. We are suspecting as I said, strep pneumonia and H influenza, more of the vaccination strep pneumonia. It is definitely sensitive. There are CMC value study has clearly differentiated the strain of uh, to be sensitive to the amoxicillin. So go at 40 to 50 milligram per pin. They have clearly said only the meningitic strain is showing resistant to ceftriaxone. Right. So in this condition, stick to 40 to 50 milligram per kg. You are you are you will be definitely going through this. So again, uh, it depends on if you are sure about the strep pharyngitis, complete the dosage as we already said to about 10 for 10 days. If right. you have to complete it, so 10 that days is, the is compulsory. Case. Right. So the normal dosage, the routine recommended dosage of amoxicillin in the recommended uh, duration, definitely we would. Give. Right. So what are other organisms here that you want to treat? Apart from gas, H flu, H influenza, okay, okay. Okay. all, all of so them also the, will respond. That the strategy to might change. change. But as far as gas Five is concerned, days. ten days. See, I have put a little bit of summary here that we get uh, GABHS. It's a commonest organism. Then Streptococcus pneumoniae, then H influenza, and occasionally this other organism. So here the basis is that GABHS, that is your gas, is universally sensitive to penicillin. So you don't have to think again about no changing antibiotic, go for amoxicillin, that is penicillin. As pneumonia develops resistance, uh, amino penicillin is by altering PBP, that is penicillin binding proteins and not by producing beta lactam. So sometimes this is a general uh, know, analysis of how we should choose an antibiotic. So increasing the dose is the answer and not adding uh, beta lactam as to that, I mean the combination of BLI. And in India there is no significant DRSP as she said and macrolide resistance is 30 to 40 percent. So when we talk about treating a URTI, don't use azithromycin because the resistance is very high, 30-40 percent. And H influenza, if you are thinking about it, it does produce beta lactamase. So here BLI is, uh, you know, uh, justified. Sir, uh, so one more thing uh, regarding the if it is recurrent. Uh, even though we have to treat with the amoxicillin on. Yeah, we are coming to that. We are coming yeah. to that. So, one more so, thing is the vaccination, the history of vaccination, sick looking yes. child, that will again determine. Again, so now because it has become patient. universal, we should inquire yeah. about vaccination. Very good. So, these are some of the virals. EBV, we have already discussed and recently, you know, there was a huge surge of adeno infection, adenovirus infection, which used to present with similar, uh, you know, clinical situation. Uh, why to treat? Because there are non-supportive complications like rheumatic fever. So, to prevent that. But as I said, there is a window and there can be a superiority complication like peritonsillar abscess. And C. diphtheria is very uncommon, but we have to keep in mind. And we, we see in Gujarat also, some of the district do report diphtheria. Culture only in selected clinics and clinical picture and review for help. Choice of antibiotic, as she said, amoxicillin, no issue of dose, prevention of rheumatic fever, 9 days. And these are some of the alternatives. If, if your uh, patient is allergic to penicillin, then you have this... Uh, other options and uh, in the morning uh, Dr. Narmada had already presented a whole good table about no doses etc. We are not going to detail. So now we come to uh, recurrent part. No, Hiral, uh, what are the causes of recurrent tonsillitis and when do you refer to ENT surgeon? So uh, recurrent tonsillitis means these are repeated episodes with normal intermittent period when the right. child is normal. Right. It's not a partially treated or a relapse. So recurrent tonsillitis, uh, if we look at it, uh, the one common cause is uh, poor economic household and overcrowding and school uh, scenario. The other thing is structural problems. So if there are enlarged adenoids or if the tonsils are extremely large, like uh, grade 3, grade 4 tonsil, like the kissing tonsils. So these large tonsils, a lot of bacteria and food particles, they get uh, engorged in the crevices of the tonsils and which leads to uh, the, ca the carrier bacteria and, you know, bacterial growth. And there's also this uh, theory of uh, genetic susceptibility to recurrent tonsillitis, which has been noted in a few families. So these families, they produce less antibody to streptococcal toxin. So uh, recurrent tonsillitis is also one of that. So a biofilm is formed on the tonsil. So these are some causes. And uh, when will I refer to an ENT surgeon is when I want some intervention to be done for the recurrent tonsillitis. So, uh, which is like we have criteria. So, if there are more than seven episodes of recurrent tonsillitis in a year, 
they say uh, they say they should be culture proven so now if you are not doing culture i don't know then or more than 5 episodes in 2 years or more than 3 episodes in 3 years then that's an indication for surgery apart from that uh, we'll definitely refer a child who has obstructive symptoms like obstructive sleep apnea dysphagia poor growth uh, missing too much of school and uh, also one of the indication though not common is in fapa periodic fever and uh, recurrent so these kids benefit from uh, tonsillectomy right so but by and large in our day to day practice for you no know, tonsillitis we defer from referring them to ent surgeon so two and things i want to also have learned sorry two things i wanted to add yes. one is the smoking in house smoking episodes that is uh, definitely there and especially when they taking care by the grandparents and in our places they are the bd workers are there the parents usually go out the grandparents are the smokers here so that has to be taken history and the other bottle feeding the third one is uh, definitely ask for the question of uh, refer to the ent surgeon early for this condition why because they will have uh, otitis media uh, we are coming to that. We are that coming is right to that. <laughs> So thank you for that beautiful coverage of why you should not be referring or why when you should be referring to ENT. One of the reasons for uh, no recurrent tonsillitis or any other infection is inadequate uh, no doses, inadequate duration. How many of us actually write for ten days? So I was not. I was just uh, no uh, thinking aloud, and some of you already raised your hand. That very few, thirty percent of the crowd, I could see the raised hand. Who are prescribing for ten days? Many of the prescription I see one bottle, two bottle, and seven point five ml three times. So, so that that comes to your how you are no how you are ensuring. To sir, to sir, to sir. Since you have made a comment, listen to me. So, so whether they take it or not is a very different uh, no issue altogether. It comes to management. How you actually ensure adherence to your uh, treatment. in in all aspects not only in the urt anywhere so we don't talk about adherence because of lack of our communication or the way we explain but are we writing for 10 days or not that is important okay so inadequate uh, duration and inadequate dose is also an important cause for recurrent infection so now we come to acute otitis media uh, when do you so i am not presenting any cases because there is no point in wasting time on a 6 month old child came with fever He was meddling with his ear and all. So we straight away take cases only, uh, uh, the scenario only. When do you administer an antibiotic upfront, and when can you just can you be justified in withholding an antibiotic? Which antibiotic you use? Why do you use that? When do you change the antibiotic? Any issues with the doses? These are all kind of you no know, question that arise in our mind when we deal with at otitis media. So, Dr. Jai. so treatment for acute otitis media is basically designed on the age laterality and severity of the symptoms so if the age is less than 6 months even on the presumed diagnosis of acute otitis media even if it is unilateral we can start the antibiotic upfront right because of the fear of uh, early complications when the age is between 6 months to 2 years uh, if this uh, so, uh, disease is bilateral then we can start with the antibiotics or if even if it is unilateral but severe disease then we can start with the antibiotics about 2 years we can withhold the antibiotics for at least 48 to 72 hours and keep in watchful observation unless there is a very severe disease very good so how many of you use this uh, you no know, guideline that about 2 years you wait and watch i think we should all be doing that there is no big harm and very good criteria are already put up here so before we actually talk about management we should be clear about this terminology also that there are three kinds of thing that we deal with ome that is otitis media with effusion which is fluid in the middle ear 8 weeks in absence of sign symptom of acute infection but we often miss this because most of us now are keeping an otoscope but maybe we are all not using it or maybe if we are using it we are not able to visualize the tympanic membrane well so we have to upgrade our instruments in such a way that we can actually see this effusion because it's in western countries it is very very common and they they treat it very well with gromatin such and there is no reason why we should not be getting so many a times when i refer my patient to you no know, uh, ent surgeon he would come up with this ome diagnosis so keep this in mind that we are talking about aom we should always have that ome also in mind and it is one of the commonest form of otitis media more common than acute otitis media and it usually follows a viral no rhinosinusitis 
AOM, how do you make a diagnosis? There is moderate to severe bulging of tympanic membrane or if there is a mild tympanic membrane bulging but with recent onset of ear pain and erythema of the tympanic membrane or new onset of otorrhea. Then you label this as acute otitis media. CSOM as you know chronic suppurative otitis. Discharge which is lasting for more than 2 to 6 weeks. More often we see this in immunocompromised patients or malnourished children. The causative organisms are both viral and bacterial. Uh, usually viral followed by bacterial. Viral are RSV influenza. Bacteria as we all know is uh, streptococcus pneumoniae. H influence and Moroxella. So, as uh, Jai was describing, otorrhea, severe disease. Now, wh what is severe disease? Severe disease is when fever is more than 39 degrees centigrade, severe otalgia, and otalgia more than lasting for more than two days. And if there is a bilateral AOM in less than two years, AOM less than six, he very well said that. About two years, it is more likely to resolve spontaneously. So, defer antibiotics in those who are more than two years with non severe AOM. Severe AOM with these three things, fever, severe otalgia, otalgia, you give upfront antibiotic. But if it's not severe, you can withhold the antibiotic about two years of age. Six to 24 months, as he said, with non-severe unilateral AOM, you can withhold. And watchful waiting means you give only supportive treatment with PCM and ibuprofen for 48 to 72 hours. Now, uh, these guidelines are there in the you know, recent uh, book on rational antibiotic practices by IEP. But what they have mentioned is that now AAP is liberal uh, about you know, using antimicrobials uh, with individual discretion. And in OME, you don't have to give any antibiotic. This is very important. So OME, I'm not discussing in detail. It's, it's, uh, it's a subject by itself where you, know, you have to refer to the patient to ENT surgeon. You are mentioning about okay. otitis media. And if necessary, grommet insertion should be done. Somehow in India, this is not practiced much because we don't refer the patient uh, very frequently them, to them. We do not have pediatric ENT surgeons. That's a, that's a big problem here because they don't understand well how to deal with the kids when they are crying. And when they talk about grommet insertion, parents are usually very scared. So we as pediatricians should also give a message to the parents that grommet insertion is... Yes, yes, I am keeping in mind. So grommet insertion is not harmful. It is good for the child. Hearing testing should be done in all these children who are suspected to have yes children. <laughs> yeah, it is this. Okay, it is thank, thank you, Chetan, for sharing this information. This same instrument was brought by Dr. Jagdish Chinappa a couple of years back in Webcon. He had demonstrated it. I have seen it. But when it comes to examining a child, no, you holding that instrument and looking at your uh, mobile. Doing a sign because it has to be focused here in the ear. Ah, but but then then we have not anesthetized the child. No, that's the problem. Anyway, so so it's, so, so we, Chetan Bhai will give us more experience with some study of hundred cases or so. Sorry, you, sorry, so, it is. <laughs> yes, wax is a big problem. So. So, in one of the conferences, the faculty was talking about AOM and using so It is our part of our so, smart medical practice. With, uh, yes. it, is a, it is a part of that instrument. It is there. Okay. So, you all attend the smart medical practice workshop also in the coming days. It is going to be held in Cochin also, right? Uh, not it. Go not it. Will, okay. So, it will come to your town later on. So, in one of the conferences, you know, the speaker uh, asked, when we see in the you know, ophthalmoscope, what do we see? Majority have said that it is wax that we see. So, wax is a problem. So, we need to learn about how to clean the wax also. We will not go into that detail. So, when do you administer antibiotic from that we have done and uh, which antibiotic, Dr. J? Yes, sir, the, as you mentioned, the most common causative organisms are S-pneumonia, uh, H-influenza and uh, 
uh, Moraxella catarrhalis. So right. the choice of antibiotic will be uh, amoxicillin. Hmm. First choice. Beyond that? Beyond that, uh, if the patient does not improve in next 48 to 72 hours, then we can go for we can go for adding glyvulinic acid, or we we can go for the second generation cephalosporins like cefuroxime or ciproxime. Right. So, if you are persistent or recurrent AOM, or if you have previous treatment with antibiotic, which happens very often, patient has gone to a family physician or other pediatrician, some antibiotic or other is given, and if there is a concurrent purulent conjunctivitis, then you are justified in using amoxiclave rather than amoxicillin and there are of course these are all the alternatives and interestingly i read about azithromycin that it can be given for one day three day and five day depending on what doses you give 30 milligram per kg per day one dose 20 milligram per kg per day one dose or 20, 10 milligram per kg for five days and duration there is a lot of uncertainty about it but the general consensus is that you give it for 10 days uh, at least below two years uh, uh, two to five years you give for seven days and more than five days as you can give for five days. So, what complication can happen and how do you approach uh, recurrent otitis media? When do you refer to ENT surgeon? A complication usually we divide into the uh, intratemporal means inside the ear, uh, then the uh, intracranial or the systematic. Uh, the, in the intratemporal, we having a chances of this, uh, something is like we can say chronic otitis media, then perforation. Uh, there is a chances of the hearing loss. Uh, mastoritis, that is one of the uh, complications in uh, uh, temporal also. Intracranial, we have either of the meningitis, encephalitis, any type of the abscesses and the uh, uh, sinus thrombosis. Systematic, we have a uh, bacteremia, septis, uh, sep uh, septis uh, arthritis, and the bacterial and uh, pandocarditis. That can be the complications are there. Uh, when, uh, how do we approach uh, to it? That will be the indicated mainly related with the uh, uh, immediate management of the uh, acute episode, followed by the proper diagnostic workup. What will be the including that diagnostic workup means uh, why, why it's uh, 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 present as a persistent. Then second thing, uh, the what are the other complications associated with and the right time uh, uh, referring to the uh, ENT surgeon for the management purpose. And that management include the uh, helping in the diagnosis purpose also and the uh, surgical management purpose. Like the, what we have discussed, the grumet insertion or the, some surgical intervention that is leading to the uh, uh, problem. Anything you want to add? Any other panelist? The yeah, only thing is the allergy component of this. And in the case of a so we have to take care of the allergy component. That is definitely in our practice, what I have seen personally is that allergic rhinitis is very, very, very common. common. We often fail to diagnose and treat it well. Treat it well in terms of no controller therapy as we do it in asthma. So intranasal steroid is the answer to recurrent. I mean, this allergic rhinitis. It will, to a great extent, help in no preventing upper respiratory, upper airway obstruction, and then will lead to less occurrence of otitis media as well as tonsillitis. Because the biofilm concept is not only for persistent bacterial bronchitis, it is also very much for otitis media with effusion. Right. So we do have that uh, component, so allergy and uh, biofilm set. Right. Can you please wind only, up in five minutes? Yeah. Uh, only thing is the... Uh, uh, How many minutes you said? Five minutes. Uh, audience need demand whether I tell you Okay. Only thing is the effusion may remain positive, but it's not an indication of the any surgical intervention. Right, right. So now we come to sinusitis. How many of you write sinusitis in your diagnosis? And how often in compared to you know your URI and all that? So there is there is acute rhino sinusitis. We are what we call as common cold. What we are trying to focus now is on acute bacterial sinusitis. So, uh, Narmada, when do you suspect sinusitis? Any importance of duration of symptoms? How do we categorize sinusitis? What are the risk factors for getting sinusitis? And do you need to investigate and what investigation? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, again, the same factors only, sir. Uh, this the same severe infection, persistent and recurrent infection. Child has got a fever. In between intermittent, it has not been there. And suddenly records again with a severe manifestation, then I'll suspect persistent symptoms, that is the fever and uh, the upper respiratory signs, persisting along with the headache, persisting beyond, beyond, so beyond how hours. many days you would Three to start? five days, I would definitely okay. suspect. And it is very severe also for the thing, then we would okay. suspect. And the one more thing is, uh, in a little older child, definitely headache about eight or nine years. But below that, we need to have a high index of suspicion. Anything and about discharge, kind of quality of discharge that you get? 
that is less than five years or seven years. I don't give much importance to it, but beyond the older age, definitely we would give importance to it. So, do you so. give any importance to yellow discharge? El, no. In diagnosis of sinusitis. No. So often we we uh, uh, no sort of infer that you no know, yellow discharge is purulent exactly. discharge. So we have to give and you no know, in, even in viral infection you can get purulent discharge initially. If it goes beyond certain time, no, then you start suspecting sinusitis. Uh, yeah. You want to add something? Post yes. Post-nasal drip. Post-nasal drip. Post-nasal post drip. Post yes. Yes. When you examine that is the post-nasal drip. It will be there. And so these are the conditions we would suspect. Again, the duration, the causes for the recurrent sinusitis, again, are the same, which would be for other respiratory, like uh, overcrowding, bottle feeding, and this allergic component, smoking. Definitely. So all are, these are common with common uh, pharyngitis as well. Yeah, and anyway, laterality, that is, you have sinusitis, you have this pharyngitis, lateral involvement more, 10 days to 14 days is the treatment right. Right. And uh, what about investigation? Do you take a PNS x-ray? Not routinely. Definitely not routinely. Not routinely. Yes. But if the symptoms are very severe, slightly older child. Especially we have in adult, older children, older adolescents, children. yes. Are this component of adenotonsillitis? When there is an obstructive OSA component, I would get an ENT involved as quickly as possible as well as for, do the investigation. For so these things do go together, no? Your allergic rhinitis, your OSA, your deviated nasal septum in uh, no, adolescent patients. So all these things should be, you know, taken together, and we have to address all those issues. So, we have to so think, it's we have to think for the foreign body also. Some. Yes, the sudden. Yes, as a differential diagnosis of uh, unilateral nasal, nasal sinus. Yes. So inflammation of mucosal lining of paranasal sinus is less than 30 days duration. Beyond that, you call it chronic, uh, a chronic vector one. sinusitis. It's both viral and bacterial. Symptom lasting for more than 10 days. There is a double sickening. There is a terminology called double sickening, whereby now you see some improvement in the viral cold and again the child starts worsening that you mentioned. And acute onset of high grip that she has already talked about. These are the organisms. The complications are again meningitis, cavernous sinus thrombosis, orbital sinusitis, and risk factors are already she has uh, enumerated. So what is the choice of antibiotic and Amoxicillin. what should be the duration? So as for the other things, amoxicillin is the first choice of antibiotic and uh, dosage, we would start with the routine 50 mg per kilogram and duration is 10 to 14 days or at least 7 days after the resolution of symptoms. So here there is no confusion. Once you make a diagnosis of acute bacterial uh, uh, sinusitis, make it a point that you give for enough duration. When do you refer to ENT surgeon and do you call back the patient and review the precision? There is an answer in this question actually. <laughs> when the when we are dealing with a chronic sinusitis lasting for more than three months, or when the acute or subacute sinusitis not responding to the proper line of treatment uh, with the proper choice of appropriate choice of antibiotic given for the appropriate duration and appropriate dosage, and uh, when we are expecting or uh, there is impending or manifested. Uh, uh, complications like uh, severe frontal headache or neurological symptoms or periorbital cellulitis. In such cases, we have to refer to the ENT right, surgeons. Right. So the problem with uh, no ENT surgeons, as you uh, we heard, I mean we talked about earlier, is that they are not pediatric ENT surgeons. We don't have them. So often their antibiotic choices are you no know, off the mark. Their doses are very very you no know, pathetic. I would say. And they prescribe a lot of this decongestant, antihistaminics, uh, nasal drops and everything. Steroid so is the you favorite. The best way is refer to ah, it. Steroid it also. Get the diagnosis, ask them to come back to you. Yes, yes. So I always you know, call the patient, ke bhai, aavi ne jo jo, pachi badu chalu kar dio. So, but uh, so, uh, older children, older children, they advise uh, nasal wash. I think that's an approved nasal therapy. Education. That now it is with Corona, it came as a Niti or Neti or something. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's an approved therapy even before Corona. So it is a wash actually, basically. So, so that's here, fine. sir, here we are referring the patient to the ENT surgeon for some surgical intervention. So yes, but I, then they, they, they don't I'm think before not, yeah. no, like but we, yeah, we do call them back for uh, the <laughs> proper choice of antibiotic and proper dosage and duration. Yeah, yes, yes, it. you have already mentioned that. So we now quickly go to two, three conditions. So short answer, we'll finish in time, five minutes. Do you see pertussis in your practice? Do you prescribe antibiotic and why? Which? Samir? Yes. Uh, definitely we all see pertussis in the regular practice. 
and the typical presentation of that whooping we uh, never miss that uh, uh, type of disease unfortunately we don't see that typical we see prolonged cough right yeah but we usually see that uh, and we can at least uh, diagnose that thing and if we diagnose early antibiotic is always the ideal way to get the maximum uh, uh, response with that antibiotic second important thing if we uh, start late it may prevent to the uh, recurrence also and the uh, prevention to the spread to the other people also so more Profilaxis. important than treating the you no know, because usually we don't make a diagnosis in 4 5 days it's usually after the cough gas prolonged so the idea is to prevent the spread of the yeah. you know the infection to the community that's why we given which antibiotic we prefer preferably is the macrolid and oh, that uh, azithromycin is the preferred right Now, go group. Uh, can you treat on OPD basis and how and role of antibiotics? Uh, again, it depends on the condition of the patient, sir. So exactly. if it's so a very mild. How do you categorize a patient with group? Yeah, in group, if the patient makes me to call them into my office, if I'm able to hear the sound, then it is really very severe. Or uh, either respiratory distress, saturation, and then irritability. All that will decide. If the child is otherwise okay, and child sitting on the mother's lap and crying, when I when they cry, I hear the whoop. Then it is a mild variety. Right. So this is the only category I can put it on the OPD basis. Right. The other category I would like to observe. But even in those OPD category, I clearly tell them when the whoop becomes more or child is not feeding, the respiratory distress is more. Ask them to come back even in the night time. So what do you do in the OPD? So usually, if I'm going to treat them as a OPD basis, give a dosage of steroids alone, sir. Don't okay. give for that. But if it's a moderate to severe category, if I'm going to observe them, then adrenaline nebulization followed on with the steroid also because the post complication it I have to treat it. Right. Observe them minimum for 12 to 24 hours because there will be a recurrent at the end of 12 hours. More than two dosage of adrenaline has not been required in the practice. Right. There. And how what what kind of response you expect when you give uh, steroid or adrenaline? So. Usually, it is dramatic. It Usually is very, it dramatic. dramatic. The sound dramatic. immediately comes down. So it's, it's one of the condition the parents feel that you are a god. Yeah. I think more than that. So that's about croup. And shall we take up report question, rapid question? So how often do you treat pneumonia in OPD basis? Can you differentiate between viral and bacterial? And does it affect your decision? Quick. OPD basis, uh, sir. As she's already said, sick child. respiratory distress uh, saturation all of that so they'll go to the hospital pneumonia less than 3 months will go to the hospital so uh, i will treat a child on opd basis who is stable feeding well can you will... can you can you differentiate between do you make an attempt to uh, see whether it's a viral or bacterial and does it make a difference in our practice so sir uh, if this is bronchiolitis kind of a viral it will make a difference if it is bronchiolitis we are talking about even... community acquired pneumonia so community acquired uh, pneumonia uh, if i am seeing a pneumonia on x ray as that what you are asking sir a consolidation <laughs> you are asking yes even then... if you are seeing on x ray yeah so if i am seeing a consolidation x ray is not going... advised actually in theoretically no so you, in... Don't, you make a clinical so clinically sir if i have bilateral signs And I have uh, crepitations with wheezing. Suppose you are treated by... on OPD basis, what precaution will you take? I will ask the child to come back, follow up in forty-eight hours to look for improvement or worsening. Anybody and... wants to add to this viral versus yeah, no, bacterial? This, this chest X-ray you said no, sir. Again, it is the community oriented or so one-to-one practice. Let us be very frank that when we are having a child who is having a respiratory difficulty, fever beyond three months. Three days and sick. I would definitely go for an X-ray. Just X-ray. No, no, I am not talking about X-ray. I am talking. Will you? Would you like to differentiate? Suppose it is a OPD patient who has come with little tachypnea, yeah. fever, some chest sign, and uh, you make a clinical diagnosis: community acquired pneumonia, right? Yes. Sir. Uh, then, uh, will it make a difference whether it's bacterial or viral? I mean, in our day-to-day practice, we talk about rational antimicrobial practices. The question is very simple. So, so I am asking the audience. So how many of you don't give antibiotic to a patient who is diagnosed as CAP, probably viral? So, so that's the message. Here is one condition where you are justified in giving antibiotic, empirical antibiotic. That was the message. Absolutely. And uh, so it doesn't affect our decision. But of course, when if the child progresses badly, you no, know, you investigate and all that. It is ten days, ten days. Okay. So, uh, how do you decide the choice of antibiotic quickly, Dr. Jay? The choice of antibiotic basically depends on the age of the child and the severity of the symptoms. 
below the three months of age, the child goes to the hospital straight away for the treatment. Uh, between three months to five years, if it is a mild pneumonia, which is defined as the fever, uh, rapid breathing, with or without the presence of chest restrictions, this, this can be treated uh, home-based treatment with the oral antibiotics. The first choice of antibiotics in such cases, again, amoxicillin. Second line of antibiotic is amoxiclave, cefodoxime or cefuroxime. And if we are suspecting uh, Staph aureus, then we can go for the linezolide or oral, oral clindamycin. We, we will not go into those details which are, you know, we are talking about office practice. So, mm. as you very rightly said, you know, mainly you have to look at the age of the child mm. and other background of the child. So, depending on that, you make a choice of antibiotic. And what are the cautions one need to exercise while treating uh, community acquired in office practice? Samir Bhai. Hello. You have made a diagnosis, you have decided to treat, or parents have decided. Sometimes they don't agree to know uh, for your indoor admission. And often to our big surprise, they do well also on, on our OPD treatment. Many a times it happens, they don't get admitted. And we prescribe uh -huh. antibiotic, either amoxicillin or amoxicillin, they do well. So when, when you are agreeing to treat on OPD basis, what precaution, what reflex signs you will tell the parent? That's, what Haan, that's, that's the thing. Right. One thing, if we start the treatment, uh, what accurately that Tushar Bhai says, start the antibiotic in the right dosage, second is the right duration, along with the supportive management, that is a very, very important nutrition because we are treating in OPD basis, so patients should know what are the precautions and nutrition they have to take so at red home. Flex, red flex, what are the red ha, flex? Red flex tell? and with, uh, means the deterioration of the symptoms that increase the respiratory rate and the uh, looks like a uh, problematic thing. We have to check and proper regular follow-up is very important, sometimes including the isolation and importance of the vaccination also we have to keep that. Thank you, thank you. So, to summarize, URTIs are clinically possible to differentiate between viral and bacterial. You can be very confident about not giving an antibiotic on day 1 or day 2 or day 3 of fever. There are if no danger signs, you can wait. And community acquired pneumonia empirical antibiotics are justified. Antivirals in epidemiological setting, like say, ILI illness is where you no know, epidemic of uh, flu is going on, influenza, and you can give oseltamivir. And choice of antibiotic depends on suspected common pathogen. You have to have that in mind, the age in which these uh, organisms are common, accordingly you decide, and severity. So, talk and think before you ink. So, think before ink is very well known. I have added talk. It means you need to communicate well with your parents or your patients. Then only they will agree to your you know, suggestion of withholding the antibiotic. So, the main message was to be confident about not giving an antibiotic in our day-to-day. -day. Like, all the time, there are 10 patients who are URTI. How many antibiotics are you going to get? How many of them are you going to get? How many of them are you going to get? Oh, but there is no one. There is no one. There is no one. There is no one. Thank you all. Thank you all. I, I thank my panelists. I mean, brilliant job they have done. For a very common topic, but often we get confused with no, this some of the guidelines. So, thank you all panelists. Thank you. Thank you.